There had been something faintly unsettling about the quiet smile playing around Young Hay's mouth. What seemed to be happening was that Young Hay was retreating from herself, becoming as distant to herself as she was to her sister, a forlorn face behind a mask of composure. This was clearly nothing like the melancholy that sometimes afflicted her husband, and yet in certain respects, they were both baffling to her in exactly the same way. They were both descending further into silence. Hey, this is Eric. This is Nick. And this is David. Welcome to another episode of the Books of Some Substance podcast. On this episode, we are talking about Han Gang's The Vegetarian, which was published in Korea, I think, in 2007, and then finally translated into English in 2015. It also won the Man Booker Prize the year after that. Yep. So this book, it's told in three parts, and it's essentially about one character's transformation into what she believes is some sort of tree. Plant-based form. Plant-based life form. But it's told in different perspectives across time. So it starts in the first section through her husband's perspective as she no longer eats meat. In the second by her brother-in-law, who uses her, and by the third, from her sister's perspective. And we get insights into her slow transformation or descending into insanity, however you want to read it, from these three people. And through them, get an idea of of what it's like. I think, I don't know. I mean, we can get into what you think this, this book is actually about. But yeah, that's a quick little summary of it. It's not genre fiction, everybody. This turning into the tree thing is not what you think. Yeah, it's not literally happening. It's not magical realism. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Although the author, Han Kang, did write a short story where a woman does turn into a house plant and the husband takes care of her. That, I think, is the basis for part of this story anyway. So you outlined basically the structure of this, which I think is a good spot to start. So essentially we have those three sections. And there's an interesting detail in there too, where the first section where we're following uh, Young Hae's husband is written in the first person, but the second yep. two sections are written in the third person. So opening question to you guys is, you know, what did that structure bring to you? And does that little flip of first person versus two sections of third person give you anything extra? Well, I think it's also complicated that in that first section, there are these interludes that I think are from young Hayes' perspective, correct? Yes, often the dream sequences. Yeah. So there's a mosaic of perspectives (laughs) and voices here. I, I would say it seems intentional for the social critique that the novel is doing, which is part of the book. To get the husband's first person perspective, to start the book. It's a way of forcing you to view the character a certain way. Because in the beginning, I think, in the very beginning, you don't really necessarily know why, and I don't know if you ever do, why Young Hae decides to become a vegetarian in the beginning. But you're viewing her actions through her husband, which all of her actions seem totally insane and unreasonable. But you also get a read on him as a character in how he portrays his wife. Mm -hmm. But also at the same time, those second two sections are very close third person. It's not, they don't feel that removed. So I I actually don't know how much the, the shift really does for you as a reader, but I think putting you in to the husband's viewing of his wife in the beginning is part of what the author is trying to comment on in terms of Korean expectation and relationships between spouses and that sort of thing. It's also a dialogue though, too. I mean, I just, I I saw those sort of what I'm assuming are these sort of dream sequences that young Hay is recounting, you know, it's from her perspective. So you get this sort of interesting back and forth between the husband who's very almost matter of fact in the way that he's narrating the story. And then there are these 
often very rich sort of interludes that seem to be coming from her perspective. And arguably the only time we really get a sense of her voice in an intimate way. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was, I was very fascinated by that because I, I really enjoyed that dynamic and then it totally shifts in parts two and three. And, um, you know, I, I haven't, really circled the square in terms of why this triad sort of structure, why these three different narrators, why these sort of three different uh, arguably aims of each section. But I was also surprised by the end, how well for me it held together. And I'd be curious to know when you two got to the end of it, did you feel it held together as a uniform piece or was it, did it feel sort of disjointed because of the, the way that each of the three sections were so distinct? Mm-hmm. So a couple things you guys laid out there to unpack. So first thing, David mentioning, you know, the social critique, which I think is kind of the literal reading of this. And yeah. so it's pretty easy to jump into that, you know, critique of Korean culture and um, basically gender standards and expectations, stuff like that. And that is pretty, pretty baseline. And I don't necessarily know if you really get a lot more with the first person of the husband. Mm-hmm. To me, at times it feels pretty flat. Just like, here's a standard shitty dude. Does that make sense? Yeah. And and her dad. Yes. Is another also, yeah. Pretty also, shitty dude too. just, you know, archetype, horrible character, right? And I agree with your point, Eric, in that in the first section is really the only time we get any sort of view into young Hay because in the latter sections, she's just really this extremely quiet, extremely passive entity. Um, which I think transitions well into the, um, I don't know, more theoretical reading of it, which is really just a meditation on agency and autonomy and how much control do you really have over anything. And if you go against the standards and the grains and the stream, you know, do you just get forced back into that anyway? And then to your question, Eric, which is essentially does it get tied back together? And this is actually my favorite part of the book, which is seeing it through Inhe's, uh, you know, the impact on Inhe of, of dealing through this and trying to care for her sister and realizing that if you do go against the grain or you do try to achieve that autonomy or agency, it may then have a tangible impact on somebody else. And so I think that's kind of the difficult part of this is you can argue whether or not, you know, young Hay's decisions and and quote unquote change is appropriate. Is it mental illness? Is it agency? But ultimately, I think the emotionally moving part is the impact that you see on her sister. And I think that's what gets tied back together with the three pieces. I agree with you, Nick. I think the book is essentially about alienation and removing yourself from societal expectations, but also trying to find where you fit into the world in in a way that is, I guess, yeah, goes against what is expected of you in society. And then how it does tie in to the sister in particular is the most moving section. And it, it makes the book feel more whole. And I think it progresses. So I think the first section is certainly written through the husband's perspective in a very matter of fact way, which fits his character. Like he talks about how he doesn't, he doesn't want to rock the boat in any way. He's looking for the very middle of the road, everything, which is why he chose this person, Young Hae, as his wife, why he went to a particular school, why he had a particular job. And then you get the brother-in-law's narrative. And again, it's another male perspective. And it's another person who is using this woman for his own devices. And in in Inhei, you see someone who is connected and who seems to care for her, kind of understands her, but doesn't fully, and has a sense of, uh, a greater sense of responsibility for what's happening to her, but also it's not only that, which is, I think, what makes it unique. There's resentment in there as well. Like, there's a section where she, she, like, is upset that she broke free in a way from, from life. Well, I mean, I agree with both of you that the third section really brought it home. I was sort of 
on the fence after the first two. It's like, oh, this first one's kind of an allegory and either sort of a Kafka or sort of a Murakami or whatever, you know, sort of um, manner. And then the second one seemed to be this sort of, I don't know, meditation on art and the artist a little bit. And and even though we're still funneling it through those umbrella themes that you talked about, it seems to really dig into that a little bit. I was sort of reminded of that Kafka story, the hunger artist, artist, I think it's called Mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, But that last section was really powerful. And in hindsight, it's one of these books that kind of from a structural or on paper standpoint shouldn't really work. And somehow it still does. I was, I was very moved by that last section Um, and it made me sort of go back to the first one and read some of those interludes those dream sequence interludes that are from young Hay's perspective. And I began to see a little bit more rhyme to the reason, so to speak of what the author was doing. And, and I think when, when books are written this very sort of spare way, it's easy to kind of sometimes overlook the sort of the stealthy artistry of, of what's going on. I think in, in this book pretty well. Yeah. I, I was going to say the dream snippets are not necessarily through her, perspective exactly they're almost stream of conscious poetry right. that describe the dream so it's not like she's describing the dream or analyzing the dream in any way you're right. literally just like placed inside of it and seeing the blood right. the face the meat in a very sort of like surreal depiction of what seems like cannibalism almost <laughs> Although the the one interlude where she talks about the dog that they had, where they had to, where the dog. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And I thought that that was one of my favorite passages in the book. I mean, I thought that was really striking. Um, and and that's the one I went back to when I finished the the book entirely because there was there seemed to be a little bit of call and response to a little bit of the first and third sections, you know, that I'm certainly imposing. I'm sure that. I don't know how intentional it was, but again, it sort of, it surprised me how, how the, the um, cumulative effect of the book actually was much more than I was expecting. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a wrap. <laughs> I don't know what else, what's, what's another good trajectory. Well, uh, maybe, maybe this middle section, which we're haven't talked about, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe curious to hear about, that was the one that still felt a little out of place to me, although I understand its purpose. Um, and it was, you know, compulsively readable. Don't get me wrong. Um, but that's the one that's, that's still in my head that even though I love that last paragraph of how it ended quite a bit and when it all comes to, when it all comes crashing down. But that was the one that was less compelling when I consider the whole, I guess. And I'm curious mm. to know if how you two felt about it. It seemed to me a balance between the first and the last section in that in the first, you don't really feel any sort of sympathy for the husband. I mean, if you did, it certainly was erased after he raped his wife. And in the third, there's a lot of, you really feel for Inhe in addition to feeling for, for young Hay, you feel for, for her and what she's going through. And in the second section, we, again, we have a sort of distant husband who's not really interested in his wife or everything that she does for him but you can tell he has some something in him he's not Mm -hmm. he doesn't seem like a complete and total (laughs) asshole i guess and and maybe that's for the art it's for the art (laughs) there's a little bit of that in there but you also feel like he's kind of a shit artist (laughs) you know yeah charlatan the way the way his video (laughs) art is described where he's for no particular reason, throwing in images of birds in flight. It's like, oh, why? You know, I just felt like it, which is <laughs> not a great response. They sound like kind of like underproduced, like black and white, like political music videos. That's the vibe I got from <laughs> descriptions yeah. of his video art. Like, here's a city. Here's urban decay. Here's birds flying. Yeah. <laughs> here's a funeral. Here's people weeping. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, as you, as you two talk... I wonder if part of my ambivalence about that second section is also that it feels maybe the most familiar in terms of storytelling. And, and I have to admit, too, I have an aversion to these sort of, you know, 
genius for my art. I can do anything for my art. Damn the consequences, you know, whether it's Phantom Thread or Tar or to name a few contemporary films that come to mind. And I don't feel that I feel like once we venture into this into this art world, sometimes it just I don't know, maybe it's just because I've I'm in it at times. It just it feels very contrived to me. I think it's supposed to here. Yeah. Yeah, is that what you think it's supposed to? Yeah. I mean, he's clearly not good at his art, and this is the one thing that seems to be unique in a way. Although, again, it's sort of poisoned by the pornography of it, maybe. Mm-hmm. Well, so here, here's a question of, of kind of this, I don't know, this tension, I would say, which is if this is a critique on, you know, standard social structures uh, in Korea... This is a character who is basically going against those by being an yeah. artist, by not having a standard job, by not following um, in those footsteps. But at the same time, but he's that also... That is a critique, actually. Certainly in Korean culture, for a man not to work and provide for his family and for his wife to do everything, is looked at, it would be looked down upon. Yeah, so that, that's essentially where... Yeah, what I'm trying to say is that okay. this is a character... By fundamentally doing that, he is going against the grain and he is looked down upon for that. But it also plays into the overall point here is that women in this story are being taken advantage of in every possible direction. So he's simultaneously, regardless of the quality of his art, kind of going against the grain while also basically putting all of this back on his wife and taking advantage of young Hay as well. And so yeah. I feel like he's, there's a there's a push pull there that's not as black and white as say the first uh section with young Hay's husband, Mr. Chung. Right? He's very standard, very um fits into the mold and as we described him earlier just the standard shitty dude, but here the middle section we have somebody who I think is kind of up for debate. Still ultimately shitty, but there's something in there. And it brings up the question of, do you view Young Hay as being totally insane or as someone who's trying to... to do, is she insane? Ooh, I don't like black and white questions like this. Insane in sort of a <laughs> Joan of Arc transcendental sort of way. You know, However I, you want to view it. I mean, people... I mean, I think there's, I think there's some delusion. I think there's some delusion yeah. there, but it seems to be motivated by this need to transcend the 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 constraints that are on her. And, and this is another question that comes up with that question is that, do you think the book resolved this kind of interweaving of social critique and arguably allegory in a way that felt felt right or felt accomplished enough or did did did, did the author basically accomplish that sort of interweaving because because I, I think the more we talk the more I'm like hey there's this there's there's a lot of different sort of types of storytelling that are happening here and um, and I think it's stealthy in the way that it manages to pack all that in. And I'm just curious if people felt it does it in a, in a very sort of successful way. Well, the reason I asked that first question was because related to the second section, I was curious if you saw Young Hay as having any agency whatsoever because she decides to participate in this art. Mm-hmm. But how you view her her level of sanity or rationality or agency, I think determines whether she is being used or not. Yeah. I I think of it as an initial moment of agency followed by periods of declining agency as Mm -hmm. the consequences of the action begin to build. And so in this specific case, you know, as you, disconnect from society as you stop eating as you stop fulfilling these fundamental needs you end up losing more and more of your own agency because you're simply not able to participate in that same way and so the question of um you know is she mentally ill is she not mentally ill to me it's not a yes no it's a gradient where that changes over time and then i think the other piece of it kind of tying into Eric's question and my general thought about this is 
there's a question of to what extent and to what benefit do you really get when you rebel in such an absolute way? Because I think the point is, is that when you do that, you're taking something from somebody else's bucket. And I, I'm not here to say that somebody with X troubles is, you know, putting the weight on somebody else purposely or something like that. But if you exist in kind of a, a, a world where people are going to try to care for you and people are going to try to do what's right, essentially, she, her decisions combined with that declining, uh, we'll say, ability to have your own agency, then puts the full weight onto her sister, who is then pushed through her own traumatic period, ultimately has this breaking point moment where she tries to leave her own son, right? And then kind of understands in that moment what her sister was, was kind of trying to do with this stand that she was taking. And that's where kind of we get the beautiful conclusion of the novel. And so, and so does that justify it then, in a way? Would Inhei have come to this realization, come to these changes that seem necessary? I think that's a hard question to answer. Because I, mm. I don't know if you would say in a yes-no way that it is justified. And I also don't know if somebody who would try to make such a drastic change in their life is considering the ripple effect of it so far downstream. I think if you were considering the ripple effect of it, you in no way would be able to make such a drastic change like that. So it's kind of, it's like they almost can't coexist. And so you're asking a very rational question to something that maybe wasn't that rational in the first place. And, and arguably that's what makes the last section so compelling, right? That there is this, you know, what we are talking about is like, there's always going to be some collateral damage for any kind of individualism right you know whether it's movements or artistry or whatever right there's always going to be somebody in the circle that's probably going to be quote-unquote damaged by this in some way and i think that the last section really renders it in a very on the ground human way right there's, you know, there's some begrudging admiration to what young Hay is doing, but at the same time, we're getting this counter of, you know, she has a sister that loves her and wants her to live. And you're right, maybe she wouldn't have these realizations if she hadn't had to go through this, but it's also awful in a lot of ways too. And, and that's, I think, why it's so powerful because I think like in the first section, you get flickers of Young Hay as a human being. The second, she's basically a cipher, right? She's inscrutable. She's a canvas. Exactly. <laughs> Quite yeah, well literally. said. Um, and then the third one, even if we're not getting as much of a, still not getting any more maybe of her perspective, the relationship with the sister kind of really catalyzes the emotional bond that wasn't there in the second part because he just, like you said, saw her as a canvas and in the first section because the husband is a jerk. So, And so to kind of answer your question, Eric, about does the author pull this off, I think she seems to pull off what her intention was, which is, and again, hinting at what Nick keeps going back to is not being able to say yes or no. It seems to be a book of questions and she even does that in the writing. You see that written like as a narrative technique. There's a lot of questions unanswered. Mm -hmm. Is she doing it because of this? Is, is this happening because of this? I, I don't have a passage off the top of my head, but you see that a lot. And I think that's what the book is doing. And it's opening up a lot of questions that aren't at least explicitly answered in the text. Well, one of the most, I don't know if it's chilling lines was like when... The sister goes, hey, I'm doing this because I don't want you to die. And young Hay goes, why? Is, is it so, is it such a bad thing to bad die? Bad thing to die, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you know, that's a pretty powerful moment that even if she's still pretty, you know, porcelain in terms of how we understand her as a person, that, that terse reply speaks volumes, I think, about both their relationship, but also what the author is trying to interrogate yeah. And it also, uh, sorry, this is semi related, but thinking about it now, Young Hay at least starts this transformation by 
rejecting the eating of meat, seemingly because the violence of it in this dream abhorred her so much. And she ends up just totally destroying herself and at least aspects of her sister's life and her family's inner relations with each other because she's the last and only family member who will stay in contact with her. And I think for us Bay Area people, it was maybe a little surprising to see how averse and angry people got because she was a vegetarian. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah it's pretty standard. Yeah. It's like, it's pretty harsh. You know? Well, I think that's an exaggeration of the culture a bit. No, I'm sure. But, yeah. You know. But being a vegetarian is a hard thing to do in Korea. Um, less so now than it used to be, especially when this book was written, I'm sure. It was, it was, it, it was an odd thing because meat is... And meat and eating, and especially food from your family, is such an essential part of how people connect. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it became something not about what she was eating, but that she was refusing her filial obligation or the demands from her father. Gotcha. So basically what you're saying is that that event in and of itself was more of a you know stepping outside the box than simply uh, diet choices. Defiant. It's an act of yeah. defiance as much as yeah. anything else. I mean, those scenes were really pretty tough. That that was sort of the part of the first section that was those scenes with her father were pretty pretty heavy, for lack of a better yeah. description. And I think that's aided by how simply it's told, actually. Which at yeah. first I was, when you first start reading, it's kind of bland mm -hmm. in, yeah. in the style, but I think that actually serves its purpose. Yeah, the fact that it can have some, I mean, we just, I think, kind of make this assumption that sometimes more is more. But I think in this case, the very sort of spare language all the way through to the end just really packs a packs a wallop Yeah. <laughs> by the time we get to the end. It's also a blend of kind of a general quietness that's mixed with pretty high level of violence and, and sex at points. And yeah. that, that knob, as it kind of gets turn throughout the book I found to be interesting because I initially when I started reading this I was thinking oh it's going to be a bit understated it's going to be a I don't know more of a uh, an exit or an exercise in quiet exploration but it's not it's like full full visceral at at many points throughout the novel and that definitely yeah, surprised that's the me word I was going to use visceral whether it's the eating, whether it's the painting, whether it's the, like you said, the sex, whether it's all that stuff in the hospital, you know, force feeding her mm -hmm. and her, her fantasy of rooting herself to the ground on her, by her hands and yeah, spreading her legs to flourish and grow into mm -hmm. a tree. And then in Hay's experience, when she goes up into the mountain to seemingly kill herself or at least escape in some way is actually told really well. Like that's one of the most poetic sections of the book. And it's just like, she's talking about how she sort of rides the wave of the treetops looking out over the city. Um, I need more highlights. <laughs> I think that's, Sadly. that's potentially a critique of, of the book itself is I personally didn't spend very much time with this. I mean, read it in pretty much a day, maybe slightly more. Um, it's not, it's not intensely quotable in you know the english translation um and the scenes stick with you but you know just in trying to highlight things that i liked about it i it was hard to pinpoint any specific passages to me yeah but at the same time i have to say it left a lot more residue for me than i was expecting you know i really i savored kind of i read each like section as a whole over like three days and and I, I'm very struck by just talking about it now, how it still has stuck with me. And, you know, that's as much alchemy as anything else. You know, it's hard to explain sometimes, but I was sort of in your camp, Nick. You know, I started it, felt like, oh, yeah, this is going to be one of those contemporary novels, barely written, very well written, compulsively readable, but won't really have much of an effect. And I even saw your rating on Goodreads. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's probably where I'm going to be, too. And then... And then I got to this last section and, and it just both left more residue, as I said, but just made me sort of reevaluate everything that came before it a little bit. And, um, and I think 
in hindsight, I think I like it more talking about it now than maybe I initially did upon finishing it. And I think it's similar a little bit to the discussions, the informal discussions that I've had with Nick about Proust, where it's like in the moment, I'm not really enjoying it. But after I read it and I think about it, I have a lot of love and admiration for it. Um, and I wouldn't put this book on, you know, those. it's like apples and oranges. But still, I was, you know, it's just kind of this classic thing where there are these books like in the moment, they're awesome and they leave residue, right? And there are other ones where you're like reading them, and you're like, hey, I'm not really sure about this. And then days later, it's like, huh, this thing is still lodged in my brain. Why is that? And and for this book, it's it's harder. It's easy to find some stars in the constellation, but I but I can't put the whole thing together on you know how it all fits together. You know how she did it, and, and I think that's always to me a good indication of a good piece of art, whatever the medium. If you if you can't crack the code, but you know it's good, mm-hmm. that to me is always something that is worth. sticking with or um, staying with or you know loving i guess (laughs) yeah i'm kind of in a similar boat i personally like it more after david has interrogated us on it with his point blank questions (laughs) is it this or that because i think you know kind of a recurring theme that we talk about a lot is is contemporary fiction and its desire or goal of advancing a specific endpoint and i think this opens up a lot of questions but if you really try to pin it down into an endpoint i think you're not necessarily doing justice to some of the other things that it opened up like social critique for sure it's there question of agency determinism it's there but can it be both at the same time some of them are kind of anti-parallel and so I like I like that it's set up with that. And I think that's the thing that as we try to break it down is sticking with me. Because from a reading experience, I liked, you know, I liked how easy it was to read. I liked the visceral stuff. Um, I liked the questions it asked, but now I'm realizing how much how much those questions have stuck with me and how well constructed they were in this relatively compact piece of fiction. Mm. And I think she does that well and in a style that's simple to read. The writing style's good, not necessarily quotable in a way that we might be used to, especially with our Proust's and our War and Peace. Mm-hmm. Because it it's not it's not claiming anything in its narrative. It's doing it through the story itself. It's much more implicit. Yeah. And and it's also a translation too, which always is one degree of, you know, remove more than than maybe the the original intent although certainly war and peace and proust is translated too but um yeah i think you you tapped into something too that i think is it's that classic sort of opposite approach where if we're going to talk about this visceral violence let's do it in a way that's really spare and terse as a way to instead of echo the orgy of violence let's sort of complement it or counter it you know and and it's that sort of juxtaposition that makes it forceful when you're reading it and certainly other authors have done this i don't think she's unique in that but if we're looking at it strictly from a how did she do this everybody sort of point of view you know that's certainly something that comes to mind for me yeah and i think by not giving young hay a direct section or a very clear, specific, direct voice to the reader is a way to keep keep you in that realm of questioning what's happening and keeping the concerns about how people react to this thing in the reader's head where you're not siding mm-hmm. spe- with her directly. Or Yeah, I, I think that's a great point because if you had in, like an interior view, you might know exactly what's going on, but here you don't. And so now you're just... Basically, you have to sit with the fact that if you rebel or if you go against the grain in a certain way, I think the point is, is that you do have agency in that, but the result that you get from it while tangible and while it does exist may not be the result that you expect. So you do have the ability to impact the world. It just could go in a different direction. In this case, it is 
impacting essentially her her sister. And I found that quote I was looking for. This is in Hay. She'd been unable to forgive her, her being young Hay, for soaring alone over a boundary she herself can never bring herself to cross. Unable to forgive that magnificent irresponsibility that had enabled young Hay to shuck off social constraints and leave her behind, still a prisoner. And before young Hay had broken those bars, she never even known they were there. Mm-hmm. In Hay watches her sister do this horrific thing to herself, just slowly killing, starving herself to death. And yet it sort of does break her, her complacency to the own prison of her own life. Yeah. And maybe it's ultimately a good thing, right? I've taken the one side of, hey, these actions have put weight onto her sister. But yeah, I think there's, yeah, especially with that quote, I mean, you could just say that, yeah, this is the thing that creates a shift in her life. And maybe it's ripping the Band-Aid off in a different way. I don't know. We don't, we don't get that because, you know, story concludes and too many things are left open for you to feel nice and warm about it which means it's a good book What is her deal is never answered. That was the original uh, title for the book. What is her deal? What's her deal?